restarted. Okay. So recording is started, right? Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody again. And it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Harry. So our, our senior speaker today is uh, Harry Pay from the Northwestern University. Actually, um, he got his PhD from MIT quite recently. And he's an assistant professor in economics at the Northwestern, Northwestern University as in Illinois, as I mentioned. So he's, he got his PhD recently from MIT, but he has already has very nice papers where from, from econometrica, uh, theoretical economics, journal of economic theory, European economic review, games and economic behavior. So, so he's, he's very active and, and, uh, and you can find on his website that he has uh, further working papers. So we will see those papers also coming out in, in nice uh, and very prestigious, prestigious journals. So today um, he was speaking about uh, reputation building and their observational learning. Harry, um, the screen is yours. You can start your talk. Thanks so, so much for the kind introduction. And I would prefer to be called a junior rather than a senior because uh, because that makes me feel old. Uh, anyway, and thanks so much for having me and thanks for coming to my talk. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, if you have any questions, please just directly unmute yourself and interrupt me during the talk uh, because I'm sharing my screen using my iPad so I cannot see people's faces. I cannot see uh, who is with their hands and you know and what's going on on the chat board. So just directly shout at me, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so today I'm going to talk about social learning and the plan is I'm going to first show you a model, and then I'm going to tell you what the model is about, okay? So I'm looking at a repeated game in discrete time, played between a long-lived player one, you can think about him as a seller, and he discounts future payoffs by a factor delta that is strictly between zero and one uh, for all the French and Israeli guys who work on repeated games without discounting, this is important, okay? And the seller is interacting with an infinite sequence of short-lived player twos. You can think about these people as the buyers and the buyers will arrive one in each period and each buyer only plays the game with the seller in the period he arrives, okay? And in every period, the long-run player chooses AT from some finite sets and the short-run player chooses his action from some finite set B and player stage game payoffs depends on the action profile, you, uh, A and B, and player one has two possible types uh, that is perfectly persistent, fixed once and for all. And with some small but positive probability pi now, he's a commitment type that mechanically plays his pure stack of action in every period. And I owe you a formal definition of what this thing is. So for now, just think about it as the optimal commitment action in pure strategies. And this complementary probability, okay. he is a rational type that maximizes his discount average payoff, defined in the usual sense. And the long run player can observe all the actions taken by all the players in the past, and players have access to some public organizations. Excuse me? Go ahead. Uh, you, you mean pure stack for action? Do you mean that uh, that's the that's a stage game? They play the stage game that that the maximize the stage payoff. Do you mean that? Uh, there is no state, so basically the only uncertainty is about player one's type and the private value model, namely player two only cares about uh, and player one only cares about the action profile. So uh, I don't see what state is. Uh, what do you mean by state? Stage, I, mean, stage. No? I mean, I mean, stage game, just one period, as if there is only one period. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, he's, yeah, basically, that pure stack reaction means that the, 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 the best pure strategy you commit to in the stage game. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Any other questions? The model is not completed because this is just a standard part. So everything up to now is super standard. So she reminds you of what happens in Thurim Levine. And the only modern innovation in this, in this paper is in terms of what each buyer can observe, okay? And 
compared to the canonical reputation models, which assumes that every buyer can observe the entire history of the seller's past actions, or noisy signals that can statistically identify the seller's past actions. What I assume here is that each buyer can observe the entire history of the previous buyer's actions, as well as some information about the seller's action. And this respect to this some information, I consider two possible scenarios corresponding to different applications. In the first scenario, player two who arrives in period C does not have any information about what player one was doing in period T. What you can observe is all the actions taken by the buyers starting from period zero up to period T minus one, as well as the seller's actions in the past capital K periods. This capital K is a positive integer and is treated as an exogenous parameter of the model. Okay. And the second scenario is what this contemporaneous information in which player two who arrives in period T can observe everything he observes in the previous case, namely all the actions taken by the buyers that comes before T, as well as the seller's actions in the last capital K periods. And in addition to that, he can also observe a private signal of what player one was doing in the current period. And this, this signal here is denoted by ST and is drawn from some distribution F. This is the complete description of the model. Any questions? Okay, so what I want to capture using with this model are the retail markets in developing countries. And a key feature of these markets is that consumers typically have very limited access to the seller's past records, mainly caused by the lack of record keeping institutions. And this is captured by this bounded K here. And in response, in order to learn about the quality of different products, in order to learn about the behavior of, of different sellers, what consumers can do is to learn from previous consumers' choices, namely before I decide whether to buy product A or product B, before I decide whether to trust the seller or not, I observe what previous consumers have chosen and I extract information from their choices in order to guide my choice. In a nutshell, what is captured in this model is a situation where information about the seller's past actions is widely dispersed among various buyers and is being aggregated through the buyer's choices. In order to get this point, just look at the model again. And let's say if every buyer observes the seller's actions in the last capital K periods, then if all the buyers pull their information together, then you can exactly back out what the seller has done before. But things are not that simple. The buyers cannot directly observe each other's private signals and they can only observe each other's actions. And the question is, can consumers observational learning provide adequate incentives for the sellers to build reputations? And stating the question in more mathematical terms, can the patient player one secure his optimal commitment payoff in all the base Nash equilibria? The very standard question, okay? And what I show is that the answer to this question is no, in the scenario where buyers do not have any information about what the seller is doing in the current period, and the purpose of this talk is to convince you that what causes this reputation failure is not that the myopic players heard on some bad actions or because the buyer's past actions are uninformative, but rather it is caused by the low speed of observational learning, okay? The buyers are learning too slowly. You will see what this means in about three slides. And the answer to the question is yes, namely the seller can secure himself his optimal commitment payoff in all the equilibria, then each buyer receives a 
unboundedly informative private signal about the seller's current period action. And this is the case, for example, then the buyer perfectly observes the quality of the product or the seller's action with some small but positive probability epsilon. And this unbounded informativeness condition is sufficient and is almost necessary once we restrict attention to signal distributions that satisfies a monotone likelihood ratio property. Uh, a hood suddenly pops up on the screen and, uh, and unmute himself. Is there a question or? No, no, I just managed to get connected. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I, I, I first I saw a hood has a question. Okay. Uh, Right, for this audience, I will skip the details of the application as well as the related literature for the interest of time unless there are questions. And of course, after I get into the statement of the theorems, we can have a more informative discussion about what are the connections between my paper and the existing literature as well as what are the contributions. I will pause for uh, 30 seconds just to wait for questions. Good. So just one slide on the assumptions on the stage in payoff. Some people ask about the stage in payoffs and then I will state the first theorem. Okay. So I make two assumptions. The first assumption is generically satisfied given that both players action sets capital A and capital B are finite. So what I assume here is that each player has a unique best reply to his opponent's pure actions, okay? And moreover, player one has a unique pure Stackwood action. Back to the question, in terms of how it is defined, this is the formula for player one's pure Stackwood action. If you don't want to read this, intuitively think about the following exercise, namely for each of player one's pure action, figure out what is player two's best reply against this action, and what is player one's payoff if he plays this action and player two plays the best reply? And if you just do this exercise for each of player one's pure actions, you get a sequence, a finite sequence of numbers, and you pick the maximum number among these utilities. And the player one's action that is associated with his highest number is his pure stack of action, okay? His optimal commitment action. This is the first assumption. And as you can see, then when player's action sets are finite, this is generically satisfied. And the second assumption is more substantial, but it is an overkill for the results. Namely, uh, there's a section in the paper that discusses uh, the extent to which, to which we can relax the assumption, but let's just impose it for now for the sake of exposition. And the condition is called monotone supermodularity, which requires that there exists a complete order on the set of player one's actions and a complete order on player two's actions such that player one's payoff is strictly decreasing in his own action and is strictly increasing in his opponent's actions. How do we think about this in intuitively? Think about a buyer-seller game in which A is a set of seller's actions and B is a set of buyer's actions. And let's rank the seller's actions according to the effort he exerts or the quality he supplies. And let's rank the buyer's actions according to the quantity he buys. And what the first requirement simply says is that the seller, he finds it strictly costly to exert higher effort or supply higher quality, but he can strictly benefit when the buyer buys a larger quantity. And for each buyer, they have stronger incentives to buy a larger quantity than he expects a seller to exert higher efforts. And to make things non-trivial, I also assume that the seller's stack reaction, namely optimal commitment action, is not the lowest element of A. If the third requirement is violated, then the optimal commitment payoff is the same as the min-max payoff, which, which is pretty dumb, okay? Questions? Now, theorem one. 
which considers the case in which player two receives no contemporaneous information, namely player two who arrives in period C can observe everything that has been done by player twos in the past, all the past buyer's actions, as well as the seller's actions in the last capital K periods, okay? He has no clue about what the seller was doing in period T, okay? So I'll be using A star to denote player one's stack reaction and B star to denote player two's best reply against A star. And A prime is player one's lowest action and B prime is player two's best reply against A prime. And you can verify that under the monotone supermodularity assumption, uh, this U1 of A prime B prime is player one's min max payoff. And furthermore, it is strictly less than his optimal commitment payoff. And now let's take the first result, which says that in this game, for every integer k, which is the memory length of the short run players about the long run players' actions, we can find an upper bound on the prior probability of commitment type, pi now upper bar, such that for every pi now that is below pi now upper bar, and for any discount factor that is larger than some cutoff that can be computed from the stage three payoffs, we can always find an equilibrium in which the rational type player one receives his payoff from A prime B prime. In modern supermodular games, this is his min max payoff. And the statement of the theorem is also the next slide. And when you look at the theorem, what I would like you to do is to compare this results with the canonical reputation results in Schudenberg and Levine, which says that if player two can observe the entire history of player one's past actions or some noisy signals that can statistically identify player one's past actions, then for any prior probability of commitment type, as long as the discount factor is large enough, the so long run player's payoff in every base Nash equilibrium is at least his optimal commitment payoff. And moreover, he can guarantee himself this commitment payoff by imitating the commitment type, namely playing a star in each and every period. Okay. I will pause here for 30 seconds just to make sure that people can ask questions. Harry? Go ahead. Isn't the contrast even starker? Because I think, shouldn't it be the case that fix pi zero, then there will exist some k sufficiently large so that every payoff is within epsilon of uh, the A star, B star payoff? Uh, say, say the question again. I think the contrast is even uh, starker because isn't it the case that if we fix pi zero, there'll mm -hmm. exist a capital K large mm -hmm. um, so that for large delta, uh, one's payoff will be bounded below by A star B star minus some epsilon. Uh, let's see. Uh, the contrast is stark, although I'm not sure it's true. So the following thing is also true. If you fix a pi now, there always exists a k lower bar, such that if k is greater than k lower bar, we are back in the movie. Does that answer your right. question? Yeah, exactly. Right. So right. yeah, it depends on the order of So you don't need to observe, observe the entire history. You just need the history to be long enough relative to the prior. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. So what this theorem is trying to capture is a situation where this k is relatively small or a pi now is completely relatively small. Uh, it does not capture the case in which you fix a pi now, say it's 50%, it's and then you send k to infinity. That doesn't work. That you're back in freedom of the Thanks for the question, George. Okay, any other questions? Good. So in order to better understand what causes these results, let's 
do the following thing, namely, uh, I will show you the results from another exercise. And then if you compare this exercise with theorem one, it exactly unveils what drives theorem one, okay? And the exercise is something that is liked a lot by the French and the Israelis when they work on this kind of game theory. And maybe it's also liked by George because he has also seen, he has also worked on these kind of results. And the exercise is, take the game I just showed you. And instead of looking at player one's discounted average payoff, let's look at what happens if it does not discount, okay? So we fix a delta, we fix a base Nash equilibrium of this game, and let's compute what is player one's undiscounted average payoff. When he plays a star in every period, and player two is playing his equal strategy, sigma two, okay? And what this proposition says is that if you compute this, then for every base Nash equilibrium, the undiscounted average payoff of player one from building a reputation is at least a fraction k over k plus one of its optimal commitment payoff, okay? Theorem one says that if you compute his discounted average payoff, then his discounted average payoff equals his min-max payoff in some equilibria, and which also implies that his payoff from building his reputation, namely imitating the commitment type, is no more than his min-max payoff. And what proposition one says is that if you look at the undiscounted average, then it's greater than some very large number, a fraction k over k plus one of its optimal commitment payoff. What's going on here? The comparison between these two things implies that there is only one plausible explanation for theorem one, for why reputation fails. And the explanation is that when player one imitates the commitment type, builds his reputation, then there's no doubt that he will eventually receive a high payoff, no matter which equilibrium you're looking at. But the problem is the rate at which play reaches the high payoff phase is too low. It is too slow in the sense that the speed vanishes to zero as delta goes to one. And that's the only way out. Any questions? So this is the familiar exercise for people who work on undiscounted game theory, uh, undiscounted repeated games, okay? Besides that I'm cheating a little bit, I'm taking an equilibrium of the repeated game with discounting and I'm doing the hypothetical exercise in which suppose we take this equilibrium, take this equilibrium strategy, let player one imitate the commitment type, let's just compute this number. And this number is pretty large in all the equilibria. And this stands in contrast to the case in which we just literally compute the discounted average payoff, in which the discounted average payoff can be very low, okay? So what causes the discounted average payoff to be low? Only one explanation, namely the speed with which you converts, you, with which you converge to the high payoff phase is too slow, okay? And now time to show the proof of theorem one, which is very simple, thanks to the help this a public organization device, if we dispense public organization, then things become more complicated, which I won't show in the talk. Uh, okay, so the proof is by construction, in which I construct a class of equilibria that consists of three phases. For an overview, the play view starts from a non-trusting phase in which player one's payoff equals his min-max payoff. And as time goes by, play view gradually reaches a trusting phase in which player one receives his optimal commitment payoff. And there's also a punishment phase uh, that is only reached at off pass histories thanks to the public organization. And in this off pass phase, player one's payoff is also equal to his min max. Okay. And the trick is the play will eventually reaches the trusting phase, the phase in which player one gets his optimal commitment payoff. But the problem is the rate at which play reaches this phase is going to zero as player one becomes arbitrarily patient. Okay, now let me show you the equilibrium strategies 
The most interesting part is the non-trusting phase, namely how come that the payoffs can get stuck here for a long time, okay? Here is how it is constructed, which is super simple. So play belongs to the non-trusting phase if the candle time is exactly zero or when player two wakes up, he looks at his predecessor's actions and none of his predecessors have played B star, okay? So when player two wakes up, he sees bunches of B prime and then he realizes play remains in a non-trusting phase. How do players behave? So if player two realizes that we are in a non-trusting phase and then just looks at what player one did in the previous period. If player one has not played the stack reaction A star in the previous period, then player two plays B prime, namely the action that gives player one a low payoff. And the rational type player one will play a mixed action and he will mix between A star and A prime with some probabilities such that B prime is a strict best reply against this mixed action. On the other hand, if player one has played A star in period T minus one in the period before, then players will just look at the public organization device. And in particular, this probability R that I will specify in a minute, player two will play B star and player one will play A star. We play the good action that gives player one a high payoff. And this complementary probability, namely one minus R, then we do the same thing as if player one hasn't played A star in period T minus one. Namely, player two plays a bad action, B prime, B, B prime, and player one is mixing between A star and A prime with probabilities Q star and one minus Q star. And the probability with which player two plays this B star, which marks the phase transition, the transition from the non-trusting phase to the trusting phase, this R here satisfies the following equation, which says that whenever player one is asked to mix between A star and A prime, he is indifferent between A star and A prime, taking into account the effect of his action on his continuation value. The details of this formula is not that important. What is important is that after you solve this linear equation for R, you get a result which says that R is proportional to one minus delta. This is a super important part. And what this says is that whenever player one attempts to build his reputation in a non-trusting phase by playing A star, the rate at which he can trigger a phase transition to the, to the trusting phase is vanishing as delta goes to one. It's becoming slower and slower. To complete the construction, let me tell you what happens in the trusting phase and the punishment phase. So play belongs to the trusting phase. As long as player two has observed at least one B star has been played before. And moreover, after B star has occurred, there is no B prime. Namely, we see a history that looks like B prime, B prime for a long time. And then after B star starts, the subsequent actions of player tools are all B stars, okay? If this happens, then player two in period T just checks what player one has done in the previous period. If it is A star, then we just play A star, B star, give him a high payoff. If it is not A star, let's just punish him and play A prime, B prime. And as long as the B prime has occurred after B star, then the play reaches a punishment phase in which players' actions are A prime, B prime forever. And this is feasible given that once you see a B prime is, is followed by a, a, a B star, you know that player one is not committed and therefore such punishment is feasible. And now comes the important part. 
what is the role of this k here? And why do you need this k to be small? Okay, there does it kick in. There does a quantifier between the pi now and the k kick in. Think about this. In a non-trusting phase, in the beginning, then the one player one to receive a low payoff. We need player two to play B prime, even if he observes player one playing A star in the previous period. Why is this instant compatible for player two to play B prime? It must be the case that he assigns a low enough probability to player one being the commutant type. If the probability commutant type is very large, then he will not play B prime. How can we make sure that player one's reputation in the non-trusting phase is bounded, given that player two can observe an infinite sequence of previous player two's actions? Here is why. Let's think about what player two can observe. Player two can observe at most k periods of player one's actions. And given that the rational type is playing a star is probably at least q star in every period, then after you observe k periods of a star, player one's reputation can be popped up by at most q star to the power of minus k. What else can player two can observe? Player two can also observe a potentially unbounded history of his predecessor's actions, namely what previous player twos have done. This can grow without bounds. However, condition on play remains in the non-trusting phase. What you observe is just a sequence of B prime. You observe these bunches of bullshit, which tells you which are negative signals about player one being committed. Why? This is because when player one is committed and plays A star, it generates B prime with a lower probability compared to the case of the rational type. So this term is always below one. So basically, when you observe a, 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 an unbound sequence of B primes, player one's reputation does not go up. And therefore, as long as pi now is small enough relative to k, you can always make sure that player one's reputation in the non-trusting phase is always bounded from above by some number. Okay? And therefore, and this explains why player two has an incentive to play B prime, even if he has observed A star in the last K periods, as well as all of player two's past actions. Okay? All right. Sorry, Harry. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, you got it? Can you, uh, can you, I, can you go back to whether, what, what was the condition on Q star? Was there, Q star is the probability oh, Q that star the is rational is, type. Okay, Q star is such that if you play A star, which is probably Q star, and A prime, which is probably one minus Q star, then uh, B prime is a strict best reply. Remember this B prime is a strict best reply against A prime, the min max action. Okay, so, uh, so except for that, it's arbitrary, right? It, it can be... Uh... Yeah, it can be arbitrarily small, but uh, yeah. uh, for people uh, who really wants to figure out what the uh, smallest pi now of R is, then you better let Q star to be, to be as large as possible, as long as it doesn't violate the sensitivity constraints. Okay, thanks. All right. All right, any questions? Okay, beautiful moments. How do we see this result? How can we connect this result with existing reputation results? Okay, here's one beautiful slide, which I've shown to Olivia Gosner about some time ago, uh, but unfortunately he's not here today. Uh, so what Olivia shown in one of his very influential papers is that in the canonical reputation models where player one, where, where each short run player can observe the entire sequence of player one's past actions or noisy signals that can identify player one's past actions. What is true is that if you look at any base Nash equilibrium and you compute uh, what is the sum of the divergence between the distribution over player two signals in equilibrium and the distribution over player two signals conditional on player one playing a star in every period, the infinite sum 
of these divergences, then player one imitates the commission type is bounded from above by some number that depends on pi now. Okay? And this is a key step towards which Olivier showed his reputation results. Okay? Also in George's textbook. Okay? This inequality also applies in my setting as long as you take player two's actions in, from period t plus one to period t plus k as an informative signal about player one's action in period k, period t. This formula here is not wrong. This is based on merging. It just depends on the fact that the two probability measures are absolutely continuous. Okay, nothing wrong with this formula. What can go wrong? Here's what goes wrong. So in the canonical representation models, what happens is that in every period, their player two does not have a strict incentive to best reply against player one's optimal coming in action. Then the divergence between the distribution of our signals in equilibrium and the distribution of our signals conditional on player one plays his coming in action is some number that is bounded away from zero. And importantly, this bounds does not depend on delta. This is a super important thing. Why? This is because when player two does not have a strict incentive to play B star, he must believe that player one is doing something that is very different from A star. And given that the signals can statistically identify player one's actions, then the signal distribution has to be far apart. However, in the constructive proof of theorem one, what happens is that the divergence term is still strictly positive in every period where player two does not have a strict incentive to play B star. But the magnitude of this divergence vanishes to zero as delta goes to one. Why? This is because, remember what I showed you about this R here, okay? This R measures the informativeness of player two's action about player one's past actions. R is vanishing to zero as delta goes to one, which means that the informativeness of player two's action about player one's past actions is vanishing. Okay? And in fact, this is a feature not only of this particular equilibrium, but also of all equilibria in which player one's payoff is strictly below a fraction k over k plus one of his optimal commitment payoff. I will wait for some questions before I proceed to the next section. Okay, and now let's see some positive results, namely what happens if in addition to observing all of player two's past actions, as well as a bounded subset, of player one's past actions, player two can also observe an informative private signal about player one's current period action, denoted by ST, and is drawn according to the distribution F. Okay, I focus on the case in which the set of signal realizations is countable, because A, I don't want to deal with tricky measurability issues, and B, uh, if I assume that S is finite, then we lose some very important, uh, we, we lose some very important economic intuition, as I'll explain in a minute. And this, this bold F here just summarizes the distribution over signals. And whether player one can guarantee his optimal commitment payoff or not depends on whether the signal is unboundedly informative or boundedly informative. And in particular, the signal distribution is unboundedly informative about A star if for every real number M, we can find a signal realization S such that the conditional probability that S occurs when player one plays the Stackwork action is at least M times larger than the conditional probability with which S occurs under any alternative actions. Okay, so the same definition as in Smith and Sorensen.
And just to visualize this and give you a couple of examples, when the set of single realizations is finite, unbounded informativeness requires the existence of a perfectly revealing signal, namely the existence of a signal S star, such that this S star occurs with positive probability if and only if player one plays A star. But of course, the capital S is countably infinite, then we can allow for situations where this F here has full support for all the A's. Okay, questions? Now, here's a theorem which tells you what happens when player one has two actions. Don't ask me what happens when player one has three or more actions because that's what I'm going to tell you about next slide, on the next slide, okay? So when player one has two actions, here's what happens. Then this F here is unbounded informative about the stack reaction. Then we get the usual reputation results. Namely, for every pi now and an epsilon, as long as player one's discount factor is large enough, then he get a payoff, at least his stack or payoff minus epsilon in every equilibrium. Similarly, if F is not unbounded informative of A star, then we get a conclusion similar to that of theorem one. Namely, for every integer k, which measures the memory length of the short-run players about the long-run players' past actions, then we can always find a pi of a bar such that as long as the prior probability of commitment type is small enough, then no matter how large the discount factor is, we can always find equilibria in which player one gets its min-max payoff. Okay. Here's a statement of theorem. And one thing to make sure that all of you guys can sit tight is that uh, I have a constructive proof for the existence of equilibrium, okay? Because this S here can be an infinite set, so existence cannot be taken for granted. Any questions? I'm happy to take any questions except for the case in which uh, player one has three or more actions. Okay, so here is what happens when player one has three or more actions. In a nutshell, the signal being unbounded informative can no longer guarantee that player one can receive at least a stack or payoff in all equilibria. There's a counter example provided in the paper. However, if we restrict attention to signal distributions that satisfies a monotone like ratio property, then unbounded informativeness is sufficient and almost necessary. What is the monolacral ratio property? This is a property that we can have for free in a scenario where player, two, player, player one only has two actions, but it, has, it will have bytes, then player one has three or more actions. So the property says that we can find a complete order of the set of signal realizations such that the conditional probability of the signal of, of these signals is log supermodular, okay? And intuitively, what it says is that if I play a higher action, then the like ratio between a higher signal realization and a low signal realization increases weekly, okay? And this, this property is free in the scenario where player one only has two actions, but is not free, then he has three or more actions. And the result generalizes to the case with three or more actions under this monotone like ratio property. Namely, when F is unbounded informative satisfied MRP, then we get the reputation results. And the necessity part is slightly trickier. Namely, we don't have a full necessity. We have almost necessary in the sense that if there exists some epsilon such that uh, F of S conditional on A prime, namely the lowest action, is greater or equals to epsilon times F of S of A star for every S, namely uh, for every single realization, uh, we can always find a, an epsilon such that uh, it is epsilon times more likely 
compared to the probability that it is generated by the stack reaction. Okay, so it is not exactly equivalent to uh, bounded informativeness, but it is something close. Okay, and then we get a reputation failure results. I will pause for a minute before I proceed to the proof. Okay. Can I ask a question, perhaps Please. on the Please previous slide? On the previous slide, you mentioned that you had a counter example. I'm trying to imagine what's going on there. Okay, this is. Uh, can I defer your the question for, for four slides? Because once I show the proof, you will see very. Okay. Very example then from. I just wait. That's fine. Yeah. Thanks. So the, the, the issue. So there are two issues here, right? So first of all, the first question is: uh, Are player two's actions responsive? to the private signal he observes about player one's action, okay? This is one question. And this is something that can be guaranteed by unbounded informativeness. And the second question is, suppose your action is responsive to your private signal, then is your action informative about my type? This is something that, is, that cannot be taken for granted, even with unbounded informativeness. This is where the counterexample comes from, in a nutshell. But yeah, I will show that, okay. Any other questions? Good. So uh, many of you have worked on social learning and this might remind you about the well-known results of BHW or Smith and Sorensen, which says that in social learning models, there are a sequence of myopic players, each observes a private signal as well as all the predecessor actions and then take an action uh, you know, all these hurting models, etc. And the biggest takeaway from these models is that the myopic player's actions are as important efficient, namely matches the state, even only if their private signals are unboundedly informative. However, the reputation result I just showed you is conceptually different from all these social learning results. Why? This is because the myopic player's actions being as important as converges to B star or as important learning about the state is neither necessary nor sufficient for player one to guarantee himself a high payoff in all the equilibria. Why is, why is that? This is not sufficient because as important learning tells you nothing about the rate of learning. Remember what happens in theorem one. In the, in, the, in the constructive proof of theorem one, player two will eventually place B star, right? But there's no guarantee about the speed with which player two converges to the phase in which player two plays B star. So asymptotic learning doesn't mean too much. And moreover, asymptotic learning is also not necessary. Why? Think about a pooling equilibrium in which the rational type player one place A star in every period. Then player two can never learn anything about player one's type, but nevertheless, player one is very happy and he can guarantee himself a high payoff. And therefore, my result is neither an implication of Smith and Sorensen, nor it is implied by Smith and Sorensen. It is two completely, they are two completely different animals, okay? And I still have 10 minutes, which I think is perfectly enough for me to sketch the proof of the theorem, at least for the case in which the set of S is finite. Namely, remember that the S is finite and bounded informativeness implies that there exists an S star such that it occurs even only if player one plays A star, okay? And now let's suppose that the rational type deviates and imitates the competent type, then Let's ask ourselves two questions as my, uh, as my response earlier, okay? First question, is player two's action responsive to the private signal he observes about player one's current period action? If it is not responsive, why? Second question, suppose we are in an ideal scenario in which player two's action is responsive to the signal he observes. Okay, then is this BT here informative about player one's type? 
and there's a third step in the proof that deals with player two's private learning, given their heterogeneous observations about player one's past actions, but I don't think I have time to talk about this today. So I will only talk about the first two points. Uh, this, I hope you'll answer uh, Daniel's question in more details. So let's first examine the first question, okay? So is player two's action responsive to the private signal he observes? The answer is not necessarily. Why? Let's just brainstorm and you can come up with two possible reasons. The first reason is that player two is very pessimistic. He thinks that a star is highly unlikely and therefore I don't really want to play B star no matter which signal realization I observe. Okay, I think you guys really suck. Okay, and then I, I don't want to trust you no matter what. And the second possibility is that I think you guys are awesome. I think you guys are playing A star, it's probably close to one. And therefore, even if I observe a signal that shows that you guys are not playing A star, but as long as the signal is not conclusive, I'm still willing to play B star. And hence, it's like babbling. It's not informative. There are two reasons, okay? The nice thing about the signal being unboundedly informative is that it takes care of the first reason, namely, even if I'm very pessimistic, I think that A star is highly, highly unlikely, but nevertheless, if I observe a unbounded informative signal, if I observe this S star, I'll be convinced that you will be playing A star and I'll be playing B star in response. It rules out the first possibility. What about the second possibility? The second possibility is not something we should worry about. Why? This is because if player two trusts player one so much that he's willing to play B star, no matter which signal he observes, then player one is getting a high station payoff. Then what's the point to, 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 to worry about it, right? It's, it's okay. So this is the role of unbounded informativeness, okay? Unbounded informativeness implies that we won't have this situation, namely player two is really pessimistic and he's unwilling to play B star no matter what. And hence his actions are uninformative or his informativeness of his actions are very limited, okay? As in what we show in theorem one. And this slide is for, uh, is not yet for Janus, but this shows what happens when player one has two actions. So we are trying to examine the question that if BT, player two's action, is responsive to the private signal he observes, then is BT also informative about player one's time? And in the simple scenario, in which player one only has two actions, then player two's willingness to play B star can be captured by a very simple likely ratio. Namely, <clears throat> what is the probability this signal occurs when player one plays a star versus player one plays a prime. If this angle ratio is above some cutoff, then I'm willing to play B star. If it's below some cutoff, I will play something else. And what this implies is that the probability with which player two plays B star is weakly higher when I play a star compared to the case when I play a prime. And moreover, given that the signal is unbounded informative, namely player two will play B star as soon as he observes a star, then it implies that as long as the probability with which I play B star is not one, then the difference is strictly positive. And moreover, we can find a constant C such that the difference between these two conditional probabilities is bounded from below by C times the probability that player two does not play B star. Okay, so if player two does not play B star, then my action, the player two's action is at least a certain amount of informativeness uh, about player one's action. Okay, and moreover, Given that player two is unwilling to play B star, it's probably one, then it must be the case 
that the rational player one is playing a star with probably less than one or bounded away from one. And that being said, if player two's action is informative of player one's action, it is also informative about player one's time. And hence, as long as player two plays B star with probably less than one minus epsilon, then the informativeness of BT about player one's type is bounded from below by some function of epsilon. And importantly, it does not depend on delta. Important. Now, I have the honor to show the slide for Janus, which is why unbounded informativeness is, is not enough, okay? So here's a counter example. Here's what happens. What happens is that if you have unbounded informativeness, if player one has three or more actions, but you don't have the monotonic ratio property, then what can occur is that player one can play some mixed actions such that conditional on this mixed action, the probability that this BT equals to B star is the same, no matter whether you don't play A star versus you play A star. This is what happens. What happens is confounded learning. And this is the example. I only have three minutes left, so I don't have the time to go through the details, but this is what can be taken care of by the model likelihood ratio property. Namely, and the model likelihood ratio property, you can uh, get rid of this, this, this problem. And moreover, you can show that the informativeness of player two's action about player one's type is bounded from below by some number. And this number depends only on the probability with which player two does not play B star. Okay. And just one more slide on how to connect this results with Goster. Okay. Remember the inequality shown by Gosser, namely the sum of the sum of divergences is bounded from above. And this is also true in my model, where player, one, player two can observe an informative signal about player one's current period action. And the reason why we obtain the representation result is as follows. Okay. So what happens is that there exists a strictly increasing function g of epsilon such that the divergence between the signal distribution in equilibrium and the signal distribution when I play the commitment action is bounded from below by this function. As long as player two is playing B star, this probability less than one minus epsilon. And therefore, we just take any epsilon, the expected number of periods where player two is playing B star is probably less than one minus epsilon, is finite and it's a bounded number and it's independent of delta. And that gives us the common payoff theorem. And I'll skip the case in which S is infinite and uh, here's conclusion. So just a recap of what we are doing. So we are studying situations where player twos or the buyers have limited observation of player one's past actions and it's aggregating information by observing all of the previous bias actions. And the result is that in the scenario where player two observes no informative signal about player one's current period action, then we can have bad equilibria where player one gets his min-max payoff. And the reason for equilibrium being bad is because the speed of learning is too low. And we can have a reputation results then each player two observes an unbounded informative private signal about player one's current period action. And the reason is because the speed of learning is bounded away from zero. Okay, that's all for today. And I'm happy to take questions online and offline or whatever way you prefer. Thanks so much for listening and for the patience. Thank you. Any question? Thank you. Thank you.
Anyway, I'm, I'm going to stay online for another 10 minutes. I have nothing else to do, so I'm, I'll just wait. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Great to see so many Thank your you. faces. <laughs>